Hello, you're watching a lesson on defining vCloud organizations. Now, here's the typical where we're at as far as this lesson in relation to the lab design. And organizations and organizational virtual data centers are really built and configured on the vCloud director cells. That's where we kind of define the logical rules that are going to be put in place for the organization. And ultimately, the vSphere resource cluster is where we express that configuration. So when we build an organization or an org VDC, they are then translated into resource pools and networks and so on in the vSphere resource cluster. So these are the two places that are really going to be affected in this lesson. We'll begin by talking about organizations specifically. Now, an organization is kind of like a logical container that we use to pool things like a URL for special access, catalogs for vApps, the users themselves that will consume the org VDCs, email config, and, and etc. There's a lot of different rules and policies that go with an organization. Specifically, policies like vApp leases, which might be how long can you run a vApp for? And when that runtime is over, how long are we going to keep that vApp around before we throw it away? Uh, things like your vApp templates that live in a catalog. How long should those survive for? Or, you know, or how long are we going to let the organization keep a vApp in there before it expires and ultimately fades away? Things like quotas, where we can figure out how many virtual machines the organization can run or how many they can have total because those things really drive storage and memory and CPU and consumption of resources. There's also things like limits, such as intensive actions within the cloud. How many virtual machines can they build at the same time, or how many vApps can they import into their catalog at the same time? Because these are ways that, if they're not careful, if they wanted to import 100 vApps all at the same time, they could really crush your cloud if it's not prepared to handle numbers like that. Maybe it's 1,000 at the same time might crush it. And you'd want to impose limits so that one organization doesn't harm the other. And then things like passwords. You know, there could be uh, a lockout policy that you need to enforce, and you could impose that policy on the organization through password policies. So those are some things that kind of define what an organization can and cannot do. But ultimately, we're really just talking about the people that are going to consume the cloud, and we need some way to organize those people, and that method is an organization. Now, talking about people... You have to have some way to get into the cloud. You need a username and password. Uh, otherwise, we don't know who you are, and we can't give out resources all willy-nilly to just anybody who walks up and says, hey, can I have a vApp? <laughs> so basically, what I'm talking about here is we need a way to authenticate you, and that's LDAP. And basically, LDAP is how we supply a way to authenticate your username and password. Typically, that's Active Directory. We tie into your existing domain or forest's active directory, and we use that to authenticate the user. vCloud Director gives you three ways to provide authentication. The first is kind of none as far as LDAP's concerned, and we're going to use local users. Now, this isn't used that often. I typically like to have one local user in my pocket just in case LDAP is down or I need to do something and the connection between LDAP is you know, not currently up and operational. But you don't really want to hand out a ton of local users to your cloud consumers because it's really not scalable, and man, that's a pain in the butt. So none is a very niche use case. A lot of times I see the system LDAP, the vCloud Director system LDAP for internal users, or custom LDAP for third-party services. And the difference there is just, is the consumer of your cloud within the organization using your LDAP, or are they using their own LDAP? Using your LDAP with the system LDAP is very common for private cloud within your own company. Whereas third-party custom LDAP is very common when you're providing cloud services to someone else. Additionally, just because you can authenticate by LDAP doesn't necessarily mean that you should have the most permissive level of permissions in the cloud. Not everyone needs to be an administrator. In fact, as few people as possible should be an administrator. So there are different roles that are basically available to you to hand out to people that are going to consume the cloud by your organization. There's five different roles, and I've kind of arranged them by most permissive to least permissive. There'll be a lot more deep dive on the roles in a different lesson, 
But just suffice to say, you should know that there are five different roles, and really the org admin is kind of where the buck stops. Whoever has org admin can really do whatever they want within the organization. So you should be very careful who has this kind of role. It should be very, maybe a small group or one person, depending on the organization. Maybe it's the manager of the department if it's an internal department. Or maybe it's whoever's paying the bills if it's the guy that's buying, you know, an organization through your public cloud. A catalog author is someone who can work with the catalog. That's how we basically provide vApps to the consumers. They go to a catalog, they pick which vApp they want, and they deploy from it. So the catalog author is the person who can add to the catalog, remove from it, modify, edit, you know, everything they need to do to keep that catalog nice and shiny and up to date with the best vApps they can possibly have. VApp author and VApp user are pretty similar. The VApp author, however, can create and deploy VApps, whereas the VApp user can only use ones that have been deployed. And then console access is the lowest level permissions. As it sounds, that's someone who can open the console to a virtual machine and use that console. Now, don't let that confuse you with things like um, using RDP or actually, you know, running a web service or something like that against the virtual machine, they can do that all day long. Console access is specifically restricting access to the VMware console to the virtual machine. Now for this lesson, we're going to have two organizations that will be created. The first one with the red flag is one I've already made, and it's very common to see this in a vCloud director environment. It's a public catalog organization. Now let your, it takes a little bit to wrap your mind around that. Here's the use case. So within pretty much any cloud, private cloud or a public cloud that you're kind of uh, selling out to other people, we want to have some kind of service uh, catalog that everybody can use. You know, maybe it's a bunch of just basic templates of Windows Server 2008 R2, Windows Server 2003, maybe Linux uh, using Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Ubuntu. You know, just kind of really empty, generic virtual machines that you want everyone to have access to. So the trick is you make an organization called public catalog or catalog users or whatever you want. Um, and you basically put global vApps in this organization that everyone can consume and you have control over that. I've already made that one and I'll show you what I've done uh, with that catalog. The one we're going to make together is the one for development team. There's certain reasons that I wanted to choose development. And I'm not trying to say that vCloud Director is only good for development. My point is that development's an easy way to get started with vCloud Director. There's a, a certain amount of learning curve involved with becoming proficient with vCloud Director, and development has an area where it's a little more acceptable to make mistakes. You're not, uh, you know, if you catch the main production web server on fire, people will notice. If you catch the little rinky-dink development web server that just two people even know about on fire, you're probably not going to have to update your resume. So why start hard, start easy, work with development, uh, and get to know it, get to know the ropes while things are still relatively with the, the bumpers. You know, if you ever, if you ever bowled in, in a bowling alley, they put the bumpers up so that you can't go in the gutter. To me, that's kind of like starting with development. You know, you kind of have those bumpers up so that if you throw a gutter ball, it'll bounce back and still give you a strike anyways. Um, and then additionally, I'm kind of a purist when it comes to the development cycle in that we tip, typically build and development what will ultimately be in production. So development goes to test, goes to quality control, goes to stage, goes to production. I mean, that's the, the very traditional five-tier model of development. So you wouldn't want to start in the middle or the end of the story. You want to start at the beginning of the story and work your way to the end. And very similar in a cloud, you'd want to start by building out your development machines in the vCloud environment. And then further, you know, once you get comfortable with that, you start building test and then quality control, stage production. And you may not have all of these different pieces of the cycle. Some people only use development, test, and production, or even just development and production. But again, just start at the easy stuff, work your way to the harder stuff, and you'll learn a lot along the way. So let's go to the lab, and I'll switch over to an Internet Explorer window where I have vCloud open, and we'll build that development organization. Okay, so I've logged into the vCloud director interface using the vcd.glacier.local that you've hopefully seen in past lessons. And we're at the main homepage of the system. And I've logged in as administrator, so I have full systems administrator access to the entire vCloud environment. Now, like I said, I've already made a 
public catalog organization. So step five says create another organization instead of create your first one. If you haven't already done that, don't worry about it. All we want to do is choose item number five, regardless of what it says, because we're going to build that development organization. You don't already have to have a public catalog organization to do the development one. So let's click on create another organization, or if yours says create your first organization, we'll click on that, which is item number five. And we're going to walk through a wizard. And with each step of the wizard, I'm going to go over how we're going to build it and why for this development organization. So first off, the name that will be called for the organization. You may have a name for them, the, that part of your business called developers or IT, whatever it is. I'm going to call it developers because that's easy. And that way, anyone that I add to this organization will just know to go to the developers organization. Now, in the organization name at the top, I can't put spaces or anything goofy because, you, as you can see, as I type and remove the letters, it actually builds this URL up. So you have to follow the typical rules of building a URL. So we'll have developers right there. The organization full name, on the other hand, can be a lot more human readable, and it'll be kind of the header of the page when they get in. So it could be development users or something, you know, cooler sounding that they may appreciate, you know, so that they don't, they aren't just called developers and maybe they're sad about that. They're, maybe they like it. I don't know. Uh, but you, the point is you can have different names here. This one's more for the URL. This one down here is more for the human readable name. And we can say, these are our top notch developers who create the future. You know, make sure to give them, give them their props. So we'll click next. Now we're at the LDAP section. And like I said before, you have three choices. The default is do not use LDAP. The developers would be in-house with our company in this fictitious environment here. So we would probably choose use the system LDAP service and point the system LDAP service to a specific OU that contains the accounts of all our developers. As you can see here, it gives you an example of OU equals users, comma DC equals example, comma DC equals local. So if I had something in my organization, the path that I would put is OU equals developers, DC equals Glacier, DC equals local. Because my domain is glacier.local, but I can't put periods in there. It has to be DC equals glacier, comma DC equals local. And then if I had an OU or organizational unit at the root level called developers, that's why I put OU equals developers. Now this doesn't actually exist in my environment. You may want to create it, or you'd have something that maps equivalent in your environment. You may have an, an OU already called developers or IT or staff or something like that. It's wherever those people live in your organization. Just remember, whoever's in that organization will have access to uh, the cloud. So you want to be careful about who you give access to um, because you could have them go in and add the user accounts later. We'll click Next. You can also add some local users. Even though we have LDAP configured, you can still have local users. And I always like to have kind of a, a back door just in case uh, in that my system account, I've got a local system account I can always get into for the root account, which can ultimately get into this organization. You may also want to have one for the organization itself. I'm just going to create one so you can see what it looks like. You don't have to have one. I don't normally put one in the organization, but you might want to go through the wizard at least to see it. So for this new local users, I could have uh, Mr. Joe Bob, who is uh, some kind of special developer that might need local access once in a while. You can give him a password that meets the requirement. It has to be complex enough. I believe six characters longer with special characters and all that good stuff. We're going to enable the account and we're going to give him access to, uh, we'll let him be a vApp author so that he can create uh, vApps from the catalog. And here's Joe Bob. He's at joebob at company.com. Uh, we're not going to bother with a phone number or instant messenger. And we'll let Joe, Joe Bob make as many virtual machines as the organization will allow. We won't, we won't limit him uh, to any specific number of VMs or running VMs. But if you wanted to, the all VMs is how many that person can own. So he could make unlimited amount. And the running VMs is how many can be active or powered on at the same time. So if you wanted to control how much storage the person could consume, you could set a VM quota. If you want to control how much memory and CPU they can consume, you can set a running VM quota. 
We'll just leave it unlimited for this person. We'll go to the next item. Catalog publishing. And basically, you have, you have a very simple choice here. Should this organization be able to make catalogs that can be published to everyone else in other organizations or not? Nine times out of ten, you don't want your organizations doing that. So the default cannot publish catalogs that I have selected right here is just fine. We want that. And it even says this is kind of typical for a customer that uses services from VCD. Now, if you had a special organization where they needed to create vApps that would be published to other organizations, you would choose this. But really, we're going to see that after I get done with this. I'll show you the public catalog organization. That's the only one that really should have this selected. So we'll click Next. Here we're going to set up an SMTP server or mail server for this particular organization. Now, because this is an internal department within my company, I don't need to set a special mail server. They're already using my mail server as the vCloud director system. So we can use this option here, use system default mail server. But if you had an organization that had their own mail server, you could then select this here and put in the name uh, of the mail server. It may be mail.company.com. And if they needed you to authenticate, you would click this, click this box here, put in the username and password of that authentication user. But they're, like I said, they're a department within our company, so we're going to use our mail server. And then here at the bottom, notification settings. It's basically, if the system needs to notify uh, someone within the organization, what should it do? Should it use default system notification settings, which is basically email the admins? Or should we set specific ones for the organization? And if you set specific ones, we could have one from uh, developer alert at company.com. That may be the, the sending address. That's like who it's coming from. And it may be alert and then blah, blah, blah. Basically, the prefix of every email that they got would have the word alert in brackets. And that's pretty typical because then you can write an email rule that will look for that alert. And if it sees it, you can have it, you know, launch a firework or play a truck horn or do whatever it is that you want it to do or, or maybe... <laughs> Maybe in their case, it goes to the spam folder. You never know what they're going to do with it. Uh, but it's pretty common to go ahead and put a prefix in there just to make it easy to find the emails when they search for it later. And then you have the choice. Does it go to everyone who's an org admin role or to a specific email address? If you're going to use this, I really advise clicking these email addresses. So we can have it go to developers at company.com. Or maybe, maybe it would go to development, development managers at company.com, whatever it may need to be. Because uh, oftentimes you'll want them to be notified, but they won't be organization admins. So you would choose these email addresses, and it's just a group email address that I'm using here. And then you could type it in here and test it, and it would send off a test email. And if, if it worked, great. You knew that you set it up right. If it didn't work, you could fix it. So we'll click Next. Now, here's really the meat and potatoes. I mean, everything else was just kind of you know, okay, who's getting an email, you know, what's the name? The meat and potatoes is really around the policies that are going to be set on this organization. The first is the leases. And just kind of like, you know, you're leasing out an apartment. You're leasing out VApps. Think of those as your real estate that you're leasing to these guys. So you're, you're the owner of a timeshare, and it's like, how long do I want you in my timeshare before I'm going to kick you out? Uh, these are developers, so we may want to be a lot more uh, let's say brutal about the numbers or not, but typically we want to be a little more constraining on them because they're going to create a lot of vApps to test code. That code will be validated or need to go back to the drawing board. Then they'll make another vApp and the original one will be forgotten. So seven days, that's kind of low. We may want to make that a little bit higher. It's basically saying the, the maximum runtime lease. And, and there's pretty cool tips right here. These actually aren't bad. So that's saying, how long can it run before it's automatically stopped? At seven days, it means when they, when they request the virtual machine, let it run. For seven days, it'll run, and then at that point, it'll start hitting the, the life cycle of that vApp. They'll start saying, hey, you know, do you still need this? Does it need to go away? They'll have to get an exception for it to run longer. Uh, so seven days is, is kind of short, but in, in our case, the developers only typically need three or four anyway, so we're giving them an extra three days. So seven's fine. The next one is the maximum storage lease. So in your mind, let's imagine that they've hit their runtime lease 
and the V app has been powered off. It's been stopped. This is to keep them from consuming the cloud resources. So we now have an idle, powered off V app sitting there. The storage lease says, all right, now that the V app is no longer in use, how many days until we clean up that V app? So it, it's basically kind of a buffer zone where the V app's not running and they kind of have this grace period with this storage lease of 30 days before we're going to do something else with the V app. And that's called the storage cleanup. And you'll see here, there's really two choices. We can move it to expired items, which is kind of like the graveyard that V apps go into where the admin can then go and just delete them, get rid of them, or they can be pulled out of the graveyard and put back into activity. But at that point, the user really has no idea what happened to it. Or we can have it permanently delete. So for the developers, I just want it to permanently delete. And in fact, we're going to tone this down to about 16 days. You might think that's a weird number, 16. Why would you choose that? Well, I always try to go a couple days past the maximum amount of time someone can go on vacation. And that's kind of, you know, you might be think that's a weird thing to look at. But put yourself in the shoes of someone that just took two weeks vacation. I know one week is kind of common. Two weeks is probably a little long. But let's say they did. They had a big life event. Maybe they got married. They're going to Costa Rica. They're getting their tan, you know, having a fun time at the bar for two weeks. They come back and their V app had expired the day they left. And you only had this set to seven days. And now their V app is deleted. And that's, that's not very nice. So uh, I would take the amount of time they could be on vacation. We'll say two weeks for this company. Add a couple days. That gives them... Monday and Tuesday when they get back, they can say, oh, no, I need that V app. Please don't delete it. So we're taking that 14 days and adding two. So we'll scroll down here a little bit. Now we have the V app templates right here. I mean, before we we're talking about regular V apps, now we have the templates that live in the catalog. So how long should those live in the catalog? Well, a lot of times I really don't want to set a specific lease on the catalog. And you can choose right here, never expires. And that way you can kind of just work with the people that own the catalog to keep them from, you know, uh, getting stale. Maybe there's a Windows XP machine in there and you're thinking, guys, do you really need Windows XP? No. Okay, delete it. Um, it would depend. You know, for us, for the developers, we'll give them never expires for the VApp templates because maybe there's only going to be a couple and I have a guy that's specifically dedicated to keeping them cleaned up. But you could set it to, you know, three months or something like that if you feel that never expires. It's just a little too nice. And then again, once it expires, in this case it never expires, so this storage cleanup will never happen. But if it did expire, what do you do? Expired items or permanent delete. I'm going to leave it as move to expired items. Just in case for some reason it did expire, it'll go into that kind of graveyard of expired items. And I can pull it back out if I need it. Let's scroll down a little more. So default quotas. And default quotas are just, when I make different uh, users, what is the, gonna, the quota going to be by default for that person? So you see it's unlimited right now. They can make as many VMs as the storage will hold, and they can run as many VMs as the allocation pool will allow. If they're paying by VM for some reason, you could change this so that they could only have a certain number of virtual machines. So you may have given them a lot of resources and you say, hey, you can make 10 VMs of pretty much anything you want. And then you would go to here and say, all right, click these little bubbles and say you can make 10 VMs and you can have all 10 running. I don't care. But then they're paying per, B, per VM. Or the more traditional way is you leave this unlimited, which is what we're going to do, and just say you have this much gigahertz of CPU and this much gigabytes of RAM, and when you use it all up, you got to delete something. I don't care if you make one giant VM or 10 tiny ones. This is all you get. And that's what we're going to do for the developers. We're almost done here. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of config in this page for the policies. The second to last one is the limits. I don't see this one changed a lot, but we'll go over it. It's basically the first item here, number of resource-intensive operations per user. A resource-intensive operation it's things like when you copy between clouds or move and add to your cloud, uh, you know, when you're building vApps or when you're importing your catalog or you're doing something that's a pretty major change. And these are kind of stressful on the cloud when you do a lot of them. You know, if you're just doing one or 10 or 20 of them, it's no big deal, but 
Imagine if you had 20 clouds all trying to do 20 things at the same time. And that's 400 operations all occurring at the same time. You may not be able to handle that because your private cloud just may not have that much horsepower underneath the hood. So you could then make a limit on this and say, all right, each user can only do five intensive operations. And the whole organization can only do 20. So that way, if 10 people all to try to do five things at the same time, that would be 50 operations. It would process the first 20, then the next 20, then the final 10. So it would be a way that you, know, you can kind of make sure that the, the organization doesn't go nuts. And then number of simultaneous connections per VM, that's just talking about console access to the virtual machines. You may have a, a security policy that says, I only want one connection per VM. That's really why I see this used most of the time, where you don't want some other admin or some other console user watching you while you're on the console. So you may set that to one. In this case, we're going to leave it at these numbers. I like those numbers, but we're going to change the simultaneous connections to two so that you can have maybe a main admin on a, on a V app and then maybe someone shadowing him to say, hey, I've got this problem. I'm developing this code and this issue is occurring. Can you help by looking at it? And this allows him to have someone watching uh, on the V app while he's connected. And then finally, password policies. This one's really misleading because you see password policy and you probably think the complexity of the password and how many characters and things like that. And it really has nothing to do with that. All it has to do with is the amount of lockout, the amount of temps before you get locked out. So by default, it's disabled. But if I turn it on, I can make it so that after five attempts, I'll just turn it on, actually, just to show you. After five attempts, I'm locked out for 10 minutes. I pretty much always advise having this on because if you don't, Someone could write code that just tries to hit the vCloud director server as fast as it can, trying to log in with all these brute force you know, passwords. It's just guessing passwords over and over and over again. Not only is that bad for vCloud director, because that takes a lot of resources, but it potentially means someone could hack into the server. So I would turn it on, uh, unless it's just there's no way someone could get to it. But it keeps me you know, sleeping well at night to have something else a little extra here. So we'll say after five attempts to log in, you're limited to a 10 minute uh, lockout period. And that means they can only try a limited number of times per, per hour, basically. So we'll click next. It's just gonna review and let you know what you've chosen for all your different choices. I won't read it all off. There's really nothing that you didn't already see over the last X amount of minutes. We'll click finish. And there we go, we built the organization. I'll go to manage and monitor. And then organization is the default thing that's clicked. And there's your developers right there. It's got that one user that we made, and if I click on it, it's going to open a tab that takes you into the developer's organization. So you can switch back between the system organization, or like the, it's kind of the root of vCloud Director, and the developer's organization. And it actually has an X here because you can close it. You can't close system, but you can close the developer. So I'll open it back up, and then we've got administration users, and there's Joe Bob, good old Joe Bob, the vApp author that we made. So that's that one. That's why it said one under people. At this point, we could actually import some groups here on LDAP. So if we knew some LDAP users, I can search through here. And I've actually got it tied to my LDAP in the Wall Network Lab. So I can go in here and I can grab different accounts, you know, different groups in here. Uh, I don't have any special groups really made, but let's say I wanted to pull any domain user. I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Just showing an example, you could pull domain users in here and you can set them all to console access. Because it may be that your whole company is filled with developers, that's all you do. And then you just wanna say, you know what, anyone that lives in my domain, make sure they have console access. And you can click okay, and there we go. Everyone in the domain now has console access. That's a lot easier than trying to make, let's say you had 100 developers, making, a, making 100 user accounts would take forever. I could also click on the little import thing here, and I can import just one person. So, oops, I actually got to tie a name in here. Let me type my name in here. Oh, apparently it just doesn't want to work right now. I'll have to look into why that's not working. Um, but yeah, you could put in a name and just pull one specific person instead of a whole group of people. So different handy ways to do it. I don't want to go too deep because we're going to go over this in a lot more detail when I uh, fully set up LDAP <laughs> against my lab and we go over ways to control access, but just a little preview into how organizations work like that. Now I promised you I'd go over the public catalog 
organization. So let's go back into system and there it is right there. I'll click on public catalog and we'll go over a couple different things. There's really just two things that are different about this organization. So the first, if I go to administration and then down to policies, uh, this is all default except for one thing, the vApp template lease. I've changed it to never expires. Basically, I trust that this organization, which only exists to provide vApps globally to other organizations, does not need a, uh, an expiration on the vApp templates. There's going to be somebody that's responsible for keeping these up to date, and these are going to be very basic kind of vApp templates, like I said, like Server 2008, Server 2003, you know, different Windows servers, things like that. I'm not really worried about these expiring. So we set that to never expire. The other, if I go to catalogs, uh, you can see I've created one called Global Catalog. And if I click plus sign here, we can make a new one just to show it off how it works. So we got, uh, I'll make one called Public. This will be a public catalog uh, of vApps and click Next. Uh, we're not going to add any specific members to share the catalog with because we're going to publish this catalog to all organizations. We don't need to share with any one person because we're going to publish it to everybody. All other organizations can see and use items in this catalog. You could have many of them. You could have one called Windows and one called Linux. That seems overcomplicated to me. I just like to have one that's used for everybody. So this one's called Public and then Finish. And there we go. Here's the public one. If I click on it, there's a little widget here for actions. I can go to Publish Settings. And there we go, we see it's been published to all other organizations. Now, if I go back to developers, and we'll go to their catalogs, we'll make one for them. We'll call it uh, developer, just for fun, we'll call it developer for right now. Uh, we won't share with any members, but you'll notice the step here for publishing is not even there. So we'll just uh, make this real quick, finish. And then when I click on it and go to share, that's all I got. I can share with people, but I can't share with whole organizations because they don't have that right. We didn't give that organization the power to publish globally. So that's an interesting difference between the two. Now let's go back to the lesson and we'll move on to organization VDCs. All right, so we're back in the lesson and now we're gonna go over designing organizational VDCs. Now first, what is an organizational VDC? It's basically the virtual data center that lives on top of the provider VDC. So the provider VDC is really defining what hosts are we using, what computer are we using, how are we connecting the storage, you know, kind of the, the building blocks of the resources. It's really where, where are we getting these resource pools from. An organizational VDC then extrapolates further, and we further logically define those resources into slices that organizations can use. And multiple organization VDCs can live on top of the same provider VDC. So we could have one really large provider VDC that we've sliced up into smaller organization VDCs that we hand out to different organizations. The way we hand out that logical slice is called an allocation model. And that really defines exactly how we're gonna reserve or, or dole out the resources to determine more, more really around quality of service and the cost of what you're doing. Because there's different ways to kind of define how we're going to reserve the resources out of the organizational VDC. One way is called an allocation pool. And this is where we guarantee a percentage of what you need. So it may be that you want 100 gigahertz. We'll give that to you, but we'll only guarantee 80% of that. And if you get the whole 100, that's great but you're only guaranteed 80 of it because we're giving you 80%. That's an example. The other type of method is pay as you go. It basically means as you power on virtual machines, we're gonna reserve just the amount necessary for that virtual machine while it's powered on. So another way it's called is like pay by the drink, not, not especially enthusiastic with that name, but it's more as you power things on, it'll count against the quota that we've assigned to you. And the final one is the most kind of heavy hitter in that it's a reservation pool. And we're basically saying in that first scenario that I gave, 100 gigahertz is being given to you. In a reservation pool, we've reserved that entire 100 gigahertz just for you. Use it, don't use it, it's reserved, no one else will touch it, and it's guaranteed to be there. Now I put a red flag by allocation pool because it sounds a lot like allocation model. 
it's very easy to confuse those two. So just be aware, all three of these are allocation models. Allocation pool is just one type of model. So we'll start with allocation pool, and I'll warn you that all of these allocation models are very heavy in math, and they are kind of complex to understand. So it takes a little bit of work to really get good at them. So let's begin with the allocation pool, which is, like I say here, based on a percentage of guarantee. So these are the six things that you need to provide to build an allocation pool. We'll go over them, but suffice to say, um, it uses vSphere resource pools to enforce these reservations. So we may allocate 100 gigahertz of CPU to the organizational virtual data center, but we only guarantee 50% of it, which means we only need to reserve 50% of that. Additionally, we need to know the vCPU speed in gigahertz that will be reserved for each CPU because we need to pick some kind of number. Uh, oftentimes, you'd want to pick something close to the clock speed of the CPU if you know it's going to be using a lot of clock speed or maybe a gigahertz or two. I like to use two gigahertz, just a nice round number. And that means that we're going to reserve uh, values around that, that size. And I have some numbers at the bottom kind of showing you the, the formula of figuring out how the resource pool is enforced. So let's say uh, at the bottom, I've got CPU resources guaranteed times the number of vCPUs times the speed of the vCPUs equals the amount reserved. So in this case, if we're reserving 50% and we're saying every vCPU should count for 2 gigahertz and we have 100 vCPUs, if you do the math, it's basically 100 times 2 is 200. And divide that by 50% you know, of that, or half of that, is 100 gigahertz need to be reserved. Now this reservation is dynamic in that the resource pool reserves what it needs on the fly. If you add another vApp to the pool, it will go ahead and make that change and do that reservation for you. When the reservation value reaches the allocation value, the limit's imposed. So if you start doing more and more work, uh, deploying more vApps, and then let's say in that first example, you've allocated 100 gigahertz, and in the math I did at the bottom there, you've now reserved 100 gigahertz, you're at your limit. You really can't go any higher than that. The next one is pay-as-you-go, and this is really based on the vApps that you deployed. And like I say here, the resources are committed only when the vApp is deployed. If you don't build one, it won't be committed against you. So it's usually one of the more expensive ways to go because as a provider of cloud, I'm really kind of at your mercy. I don't really know what you're going to use uh, until you start using it. So one way to mitigate that is I can give you a CPU quota. So I can say uh, in a gigahertz value, you can only use up to 100 gigahertz just to keep recycling that same number. And then I can give you a guarantee percentage of that. So only 50% of that value will be you know, given to you. Uh, I can also set the same kind of speed on the vCPUs, and then memory, you're just guaranteeing a value and a percentage. Memory is pretty easy to do because there's no vCPUs involved. The new thing with 5.1 is the ability to do those quotas. So before, there were no quotas in there to do a uh, gigabyte value or uh, unlimited value. Uh, and like I said, pay by the drink is kind of the, the fun way that you may hear this one. So you can be ironic and, and say pay by the drink, or just at least when someone says that, you'll know what they mean. The final uh, allocation model is reservation pool. This one's really easy to understand because all we're doing is asking how much CPU, how much memory, and then we reserve all of it. Very simple. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're using it or not using it. It is reserved. And I took a photo there. I, I did one where I did a huge reservation on a, a resource pool on, a, on a, a virtual data center. And then you'll notice with the reservation model, it actually absorbs all that space, and I can't overcommit. So uh, it's, it's the most costly way to do it. But it's also very predictable. If someone purchases a reservation pool uh, of 100 gigahertz, you can just count that 100, 100 gigahertz used you don't have to worry about it anymore. They're never going to use any more than that. And if they use less, you don't care because it's already reserved. So let's kind of move out of the allocation models for a moment and go into organizational virtual data center storage and networking. We're just going to hit that kind of lightly uh, as it relates to building an org BDC. So the first one that I want to talk about is storage profiles. And I've drawn a diagram here to show kind of what I mean. But a storage profile is a way that you can tag 
the underlying storage to give it a quality of service. Because an SSD or flash drive is going to perform a lot faster than a SATA drive will. There's just performance capabilities there that a SATA drive can't meet that an SSD can. So with a storage profile, you can create a profile, and, and in this diagram I made one called Tier 0 and another called Tier 1. On the back end, I've related Tier 0 to SSD, and I've related Tier 1 to SATA. So you can use storage profiles from vCenter to kind of let vCloud Director understand the different types of capabilities that your storage can provide. And that's really all I want to show about storage profiles, is that this is something new with 5.x, uh, in that well, specifically 5.1, in that we can now translate that from the provider VDC up into the organizational VDC. Additionally, from a networking perspective, be cautious around network pools, because the choices you make ultimately do affect the amount of available networks. And uh, in another lesson, we went over things like uh, VLAN backed for, um, network pools uh, versus port group packed network pools and these are the things that are going to kind of drive your quota. If you, if you only have the ability to make two networks and someone wants three networks, they can only make two. doesn't matter if they have tons of resources laying around for compute and memory, they're then network bound and that they can't make the networks that they need and the quota kind of, kind of becomes irrelevant and that the, you know, the, now their, their hands are tied. So make sure to provide enough networks uh, through your choice of network pool. Additionally, there's an option to make an edge gateway. And this is how you can add more value to consumers of your cloud by using the vCloud Network and Security uh, Edge device, formerly known as the vShield Edge device. And this can provide some interesting services like DHCP, which is the way to dynamically give out IPs. It can become a gateway out into other environments. It can provide some kind of limited DNS. It can be a firewall or it can provide network address translation or NAT. So it has some cool things that it can do to solve very unique problems. You can also deploy it in a high availability mode uh, so that it makes two of them and makes sure they're on different hosts. So if one fails, the other one can take over pretty quickly. And I would say there's, so this Edge Gateway has a lot, a lot of options. I mean, there's a whole kitchen sink in here. Don't check them just to check them. Use what you need. If you don't know what it is or you don't need it, don't even use it. You know, making the design as simple as possible is always a goal that you should strive for. And the next is there's actually the ability to make an org VDC network. It's the organizational level network. Uh, that's a common network pool that vApps can use to talk to other vApps within the org VDC. You also have the choice, if desired, to make that org VDC network available to other org VDCs. So by default, I believe that is unchecked, but you want to be careful whether or not you're going to expose it or not because you can link two of your org BDCs or virtual data centers together if desired. So let's go into the lab and we'll build an org BDC. All right, so here we are back in the vCloud Director lab and I'm in the main system homepage. I've cleared the other tabs just to make it less messy. And we're going to Item number six on the list, allocate resources to an organization. This is basically a fancy way of saying we're building an organizational VDC. So we'll click on step six, and we're going to get another wizard. This is a very wizard-driven product. Um, so here's the two organizations that were made earlier along in this lesson. We're going to be making an org VDC for our development users. And again, these are our top-notch developers who create the future of applications and things like that. So it gives them a warm and fuzzy feeling of reading that. So we'll click Next. Now we only have one provider VDC called Gold. So this makes the choice easy. We're going to use this Gold tier right here. Uh, and there's only one external network called Corporate LAN. So that's already chosen. Makes it very simple. If you had other choices, you may want it to go to a different uh, external network other than Corporate LAN. But that's all we have. Click on Next. Now we're going to do, and I advise doing, the reservation pool as your first allocation model. This is a great way to learn. If you start going into allocation pool or pay as you go, it's just really complex for your first org VDC. So like I said, make it easy on yourself. Go with the simple one first, get the ropes, you know, uh, get all the basics covered, and then move from there. So we'll do reservation pool to avoid a whole slew of crazy questions. And already, look how busy this looks. I mean, if I go back to pay as you go, it gets even more bonkers. You know, there's all this stuff you gotta to deal with. So 
you know, one bite at a time. Let's go to reservation pool and we'll answer some questions. So how much CPU do you want to give to this organization? Uh, I've got about 21 gigahertz available, so I'm going to give them five. It just makes it easy. How much memory do you want to give to this organization, VDC? Again, I'm going to give them five gigabytes. I've got about 11 gigabytes available, so they get five of it. And I'm just kind of picking these numbers at random. You'd want to pick something a lot bigger than five gigabytes of memory and five gigahertz of CPU. Being that it's a lab, I just don't have a lot of resources available. Now for my developers, I don't want to limit the number of VMs. That doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I'm going to give them unlimited VMs. So the only thing that's going to limit them is the amount of CPU and memory that's available. And down here, it kind of gives you an idea what's going to happen. First off, it's going to make a reservation pool with 5 gigahertz of CPU and 5 gigabytes of memory. So that's how it's going to control what they can use. And it's saying that if you had small virtual machines with one vCPU and 512 megabytes of RAM, you can make about five virtual machines. You go a little bigger with two CPUs and one gig of RAM, you can make about two virtual machines. And a, a virtual machine with four CPUs and two gigs of RAM, you can only have about one of those. So it kind of does the math so you can see about what could be made if we went with this. So it gives you an idea. Now, you can watch that number change. If I go to like 50 gigahertz here and, and 50, it's obviously I don't have that much, but it's going to fill in the max for me. If I were to give them the max that I had 100%, of the provider VDC capacity, they could make 21 small, 10 medium, and five large virtual machines. So that updates dynamically, give you kind of a, an idea of how much they can make. So I'll put it down to five, and we'll click next. Now, like I was telling you before, we've got two different types of disks that are available from the provider VDC. Tier zero, which is SSD, and tier one, which is SATA. You could have different things. Tier zero doesn't mean SSD every time. It could mean that it's tier zero could be disk that is replicated to a DR site. Uh, tier one could mean disks that is only available locally and backed up to a tape. It could mean anything. You could even make the name SSD uh, for this one and SATA for this one, but you need to define your tiers. So for the developers, they're going to get tier one, this SATA disk. It's a little slower. And I'm going to give them 500 gigabytes of disk, which is about 30% of what's available. So even if they made really tiny virtual machines, if they consumed 500 gigs of disk, they won't be able to make any more virtual machines. So there's all different ways that we can control how much they can consume in the cloud. Um, so by default, they're going to make virtual machines that use the tier one disk. There's no other choice. If I did actually grab tier zero here, then I could do a choice which one to make default. But I don't want to give them tier zero, so we're going to remove the tier zero. And then you have a choice of thin provisioning and fast provisioning. You're probably used to thin provisioning. It's just like normal vSphere thin provisioning in which they only use the, the, the storage as provisions in such a way that the only thing that's actually consumed is actual live data on the VMDK. So it's not going to, if they make a, a virtual machine with 50 gig VMDK, but there's only 10 gig of data on it, they're only consuming 10 gigs of data. But this does allow them to over allocate, so they could accidentally kind of, you know, hurt themselves by over allocating and making tons of thin disks. So you have to weigh that, you know, in your mind. For the developers, I want thin disk. I want them to be able to make all these kind of large VMs that underneath the covers aren't using much storage. And then fast provisioning is linked clones. Now this is where we have kind of one master copy of a VApp, and when it gets co uh, copied again off of the master, it makes what's called a replica. And the replica serves the reads that are going to that vapp so that the only uh, storage that's consumed is the delta change uh, in writes so if they had a virtual machine with 100 gigs of storage consumed and they made a link clone off of that the new vm would actually use zero space until new data is written to it now there's a lot of considerations you have to make around enabling fast provisioning it's not just something you turn on and realize the benefit of it uh, I don't want to go into all of the weeds of enabling fast provisioning, but at a bare minimum, you need to make sure that all of your ESXi hosts within the vCloud infrastructure are ESXi 5.0 or better. If you do have some ESXi 4 or earlier hosts, you'll have to disable fast provisioning. It's not going to be something that you can utilize. And there's a great document, uh, the administrative guide for vCloud Director 5.1, that covers all the caveats. It's really just ma basically making sure that your hosts are five or later 
and realizing that if for some reason later you turn this off, the vCloud infrastructure will need to convert the vApps from being link clones, which generally do not consume much data, and replacing them with full clones. So you'll need to be aware that if you do turn this off, it will consume a lot more storage and that the storage you're using will have to be able to support that. I'm gonna go ahead and allow fast provisioning as well. These are just great ways that I can try to save some storage. For my developers, I wanna save as much as I can. So I'm really not worried about performance all that much. I just wanna give them a place where they can have a playground. Click next. The next is network pool. So how do we wanna provide networking for these guys? And in an earlier lesson, we made all these different types of network pools. I'm gonna use this uh, special port group backed one as an example, because then they get one network. So I would have to give them a quota of one network. If I try to go any larger than that, I'm gonna get a warning saying that it's not, it's not appropriate. I've got too many. So they get this special network that I made for them prior. We're not offering any special services or anything here. It's all blank. So we can go, so we can go to the next. I do want to create an edge gateway because I want to offer them the ability to do isolated and fenced and routed uh, virtual machines or vApps. So we'll create the gateway and I'll give it the edge gateway the name. It will be developers. You don't have to be super creative here. So developer edge gateway. Um, compact or full? I pretty much always choose compact outside of production. It just means it's a little lighter on RAM and CPU and disk space than a full edge gateway would be, but they both do the same thing. It's just the compact, I get a little bit of savings on my resources. Um, if this were production, I would choose high availability, which would actually provision two gateways. One would be active, the other would be passive, waiting to take over. But I'm not gonna bother wasting it on the developer section. I don't need high available, a uh, highly available edge gateway. And this is where I was talking about with the advanced options. If you don't need this stuff, you don't just check the boxes just to play with it. You know, if you don't need to manually set the IP of the edge device, don't check it or sub allocate IP pools and configure rate limits. Uh, this would be great if you needed to take parts of the IPs and dole them out to different pieces of the network or rate limits would let you basically, uh, if you had a lot of networking pipe consumed with other types of activities and you wanted to give the developers just a piece of that throughput, maybe it's a 10 gigabit link and you want them to only have one or two gigabits, we could configure that, but I don't want any of that. I'm just gonna configure uh, what we have here, uh, which is making the edge gateway on compact mode. So when we're creating the edge gateway, we need to tie it to an external network. So that'd be corporate LAN. I'll select that and add it. And there we go. Now it's the default gateway. It's gonna go outside the corporate LAN. And I also like to use this use default gateway for DNS relay. So we're gonna use the edge device as DNS for our vApps within this organization. So I'll check that. And you'll see in the next screen, uh, I'm gonna create an organizational VDC network. And I'll go ahead and fill it out and then I'll show you the cool thing that, that we did in the previous screen. So we'll make one called developer applications. So this is the org network just for developer applications. And we'll put all the developer vApps on it. We'll say this Network is just for developer applications, exclamation. We're not gonna share it out with any other BDCs. We don't. We want this isolated to just the developers. It's letting us know that we've got an automatic assignment of IP because I didn't choose to pick one. And I can now make a gateway. So we'll set the gateway address to 192.168.1.1, just making up a, an org network. We're gonna use 192.168.1.x and I'll give it a mask of that. So the address of the edge device is going to be this, the 192.168.1.1. And you can see here, it's automatically going to provide DNS relay on that gateway. So any vApps that are made within the organization can then talk to my edge device for DNS information. And it helps make sure that I don't have to update DNS for everyone else. I can just keep DNS kind of local within this organization. And I can make a static pool of addresses to give out to the organization. So I'm gonna use that same subnet range of 192.168.1.100 through 192.168.1.199. So basically giving out 100 addresses uh, from 100 to 199 to use within the organization. And what I like about that is it's easy to tell if it's one of these dynamic IPs. 
uh, within the range. If it has a, a 100 to 1, anything within the 100 or 1xx range is automatically be going to be given out. So it just makes it easy for me to know, you know, oh, that's one of those special addresses. Don't use it. So we'll click Next. Now we need to name the org VDC. So we'll call it Developer OVDC. Makes it easy. This OVDC is for developer use. It'll be enabled and and then we'll click next and you get the typical let's look at all the stuff you set and it's a very long thing here that looks fine we'll finish and if I go to manage monitor and then organization VDCs and then I kind of play with the columns here you can see that it's creating it and that's pretty much all there is to it it's going to create the OVDC the edge gateway the network pools will be provisioned or, or siphoned from uh, and the resource pools will be created. And if I want, I can click uh, on the developer OVDC and I can go into the developer section, which is their organization, and I can see their virtual data center called developer OVDC. And we can see that it's creating right here. So it's a very easy way just to look at what's going on and see uh, when it's building the edge gateways. See, there's that edge gateway we made called developers. If I can move this over a little bit, move that over a little bit. Columns can get a little squirrely on you once in a while, so. Let me see if I can... Now it's fighting me. At any rate, <laughs> it does say it's creating the Edge Gateway. Uh, and that's it. So that is a really good introduction into organizations and organizational virtual data centers. We've made one for our developer users. I hope you enjoy this lesson, and I will see you in the next one.